Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Public Knowledge Project Annual General Meeting. I am Alan Bell, the Chair of the Advisory Committee, and I am, like uh, Kevin just said, happy to see so many people attending the meeting, as the community is what drives PKP and its three pillars. Those include open source software that we all use to deliver digital library services, second, research, education, and advocacy efforts, which support open source and open access, as well as fair dealing with significant and welcome contributions to the statutory review of the Canadian Copyright Act. Thank you to PKP for your submissions to that important effort. <coughs> and third, publishing services, providing excellent support and services to the community and contributing approximately 50% of PKP's annual operating budget. There have been a number of transitions in the last year, and I'd like to extend my thanks to Joy Kirchner, the Dean of Libraries at York University, who represented OCL on the advisory committee and brought her wealth of experience and insights to our discussions. Uh, also now retired is my, 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 uh, P. No. Uh, I'm, is there somebody, thank you. Uh, and Associate University Librarian at SFU. Uh, it remains strange to me to think of PKP without Brian, and I would like to thank him for putting PK PKP on such a stable and sustainable path. PKP has continued to grow and thrive, and it appears he is enjoying his retirement and not thinking about us one little bit. Uh, I think we all have a great deal of gratitude for Brian, and we all miss him. Uh, next, I am very happy to introduce Talia Chung, the incoming university librarian and vice provost for knowledge systems at the University of Ottawa, as a new local representative on the advisory committee. And last, but certainly not least, with the partnership on two Canadian Foundation for Innovation Projects, as well as Coalition Publica, I would also like to introduce and welcome Tanya Neiman, the executive director of the consortium ROD, to the advisory committee. I am truly looking forward to working with Talia and Tanya in the coming year, which is shaping up to be another exciting and productive one for PKP. With that hopefully brief introduction, I will now turn it over to Kevin for the year in review. Great, thanks very much for that, Alan. Um, okay, great, and thanks, Marissa, for moving those slides ahead. Let me just find myself here. So again, yeah, thanks everybody for joining today. This is a great turnout. And at, you know, at PKP, we're, we're really always happy to have an opportunity to talk directly to everybody in the community. Um, to let you know what we've been working on, but also to hear, you know, what's important to you. And, you know, we've got a number of forums where we do this kind of thing. Um, our annual general meeting, of course, every year, but also at our sprints, our conferences, um, when we do usability testing sessions, or through social media on GitHub, the community forum, all the different venues that we, uh, we have for communicating. So uh, it's really great to be able to, to touch base with you so directly. Um, I'd like to echo Alan's welcome uh, to Talia from Ocal and Tanya from Aradi. Um, whose participation on our, on our advisory committee is really important to making sure that PKP remains a, a really well-run community-based research and development project. And of course, also to Patty Galilee, who's acting for Gwen Bird um, from Simon Fraser University. Uh, over the next hour, you're gonna hear a lot about the work that we've been doing on software development research and building up our publishing services. Uh, but right now I wanted to draw your attention to um, just a couple of sections in the annual report that we just released today. Uh, the link is available here, I believe, right on the screen. Uh, if somebody could drop it in the chat to everybody too, that would be um, super helpful. And while that is happening. It's done. Thank you. <laughs> so that will open up. Um, so on page uh, seven, I just wanted to highlight really the incredible partnership that we've had with ARD at the University of Montreal on our Coalition Publica project and the software development that's been part of that, including XML and the paper buzz work. And you'll hear more about that um, in some of the, the upcoming presentations. Uh, Tanya and her team have really been fascinating uh, group to work with, tremendous partners on this project. And you know we're really pleased to be partnering with them in what we think is really changing the landscape in Canadian scholarly publishing and contributing to international change as well. Um, Coalition Public Out that we work on is um, a really good example in Canada of the subscribe to open concept that John will be talking about a little bit later this morning as well. On near the end, page 15 is the financial summary um, for this year. Um, it's, a, it's a very high level overview, but it gives you 
you know, an idea of the, uh, that we're in very good financial shape. Um, and we're able, we're really on track to be able to meet all of the goals that we've set out in our, in our strategy document that we put together back in 2017. Um, I put together a bit of a comparison um, on the slides, um, Marissa, if you could bring that up, just between last year, 2017, and then eight, 2018, um, which shows some of the growth that we've had in some of our um, key funding areas. You'll see on the first line, publishing services um, from 17 to 18 has grown significantly. We've really been able to bring on a lot more clients. Um, and that's been just wonderful to be able to work with people more directly, but it really helps um, add to the sustainability of PKP. Uh, grants are also larger. That is with uh, the support of the Canadian Foundation for Innovation in the, that joint coalition public, Publica project we're working on with ARUD, and also with support from the Arnold Foundation. You can see that our development partnerships are a little bit down. That's not because there was actually a change, but just there was a delay in some invoicing and payment. So we'll see that going up a little bit um, next year to balance it all out. And our SFU in kind is down a little bit as SFU was paying Brian Owen's salary, our previous managing director. So we're still working out some of those changes. And if you take a look down onto the next slide, um, just the expenses between 2017 and 2018, um, they've remained relatively stable. Admin is down a little bit because we moved some things into the community support column. Those are things like our memberships in Crossref, Orchid and others. Um, infrastructure has grown a little bit with our increased client base um, for our publishing services. Um, community support has gone up a little bit. As I said, we moved some of the, the items into that, like our memberships. That's also where our travel um, comes out of. And of course, our largest, our personnel, um, our team, um, are our main expenditure. And we've grown a little bit um, as, uh, as our grants have um, started to kick in and we've had more um, objectives in the grants to work on and we'll expect to see that to continue to grow as well. So that's all looking good. Our projections for, for this year and next year look really healthy. Um, we expect to have some higher grant funding kicking in as well as um, some additional development partnerships showing up in there um, due to some of the holdovers. And the monthly trajectory on our publishing services revenue is looking better than ever. We've had some record breaking months recently. So everything is really looking positive around PKP sustainability. Um, I'm happy to report that we've been shortlisted um, for SCOS support. So we're waiting to hear about that, but we're a step closer um, in which if we're successful, we'll use that to build out our sustainability through um, building our publishing services. Um, and John will probably be able to give us a bit more of uh, information about that during his talk. Um, and finally, just uh, on the better together section of the annual report, um, I think it's on page 13. Um, you can just see our newest strategic partnerships, um, our continuing development partnerships and our funders and our sustainers. So a big thanks to all of them for being such a, an important uh, part of sustaining PKP and helping us do the work that we do and to you know, make the shift to greater open access and um, open infrastructure sustainability for everyone. So that's it for me, and I'll hand it back to you, Alan. Great, thanks, Kevin. That's fantastic. Uh, next, we're gonna go to Alec and OJS, what's new and what's coming? Oh, and I think that'll be Nate. Oh, oh Nate, for... okay, Nate. Okay, sorry, Nate. That's all right, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Alec couldn't be here, so I will do my best to fill his shoes. Uh, I'm mostly a visual thinker, so I'm just going to go through some screenshots and things of some of the work we've done over the last year and some of the stuff that's coming up uh, and just talk about that. Uh, so if you could just go to the next slide. Um, so the first thing is kind of a new email templates list. Um, this has been kind of a long running community complaint. Um, we have a lot of email templates in the system and it wasn't always that easy to find the one you wanted to modify. Um, so this is just improving some of the searching as well as filtering options. So you can kind of quickly find the email based on who it's sent from or who it's sent to uh, and make that change. Um, and this is uh, work that was funded by one of our partners, uh, Free University Berlin. Um, we also managed to port the uh, category system over from OMP to OJS. Uh, so now in addition to kind of organizing your articles in issues, you can also organize them into kind of thematic categories such as um, 
area of research or discipline or things like that. Um, and so this, this is kind of uh, a really good foundation for, for, you know, kind of our long-term efforts to better support continuous publishing models. Um, and I'm really excited to see that get, get into use kind of in the, in the wild in the future. Um, we don't have a lot of uptake from that just yet. It's pretty new. I think it was just our last release that we put that out. Um, if you want to bump to the next slide, um, this is just quickly showing um, some of the work we've done over the last year on documentation. Uh, we were able to make quite a lot of investments in documentation for the platform, um, and that really helps facilitate community involvement. Uh, probably the, the biggest thing has been the introduction of new kind of overview documentation. And that's really important for onboarding new developers, both, both within our team as well as in the community. Um, when new development resources become available, it's important that they can quickly figure out how to work with the system and extend it and stuff like that. Um, so that's been really exciting uh, for me, at least. Um, and we've also kind of built on and improved and expanded the REST API documentation, the technical specifications around that, as well as the UI uh, component library, which we're using to kind of refactor and modernize uh, how, we're, how we're kind of um, managing the UI in the editorial backend. Um, the next slide will show you um, some of the themes that were released this year. Our theme team has been working really hard to design and iterate on um, some of the theming stuff that they've done. So these are two that were released this year. I know they've got another one really close to release, um, but isn't quite there yet. Um, and they've got more in the pipeline. Um, so this team has been a real success um, since, since they started, started their work a little over a year ago. Um, and that's been really exciting to see. Uh, and I know themes are always a huge demand in our community. So um, we wanna keep that up over time. Um, the next slide, uh, I won't talk too much about this because um, it's, uh, uh, I think James is going to be talking about it um, a little bit later, but this is the new article and monograph usage statistics visualization um, that we introduced, and it's really just the foundation of all the stats work that's going to be happening um, in the coming years. Uh, and so that was fun to build, it's a fun visualization. Um, and I think James will talk more about that later. Um, speaking of what's coming up, um, the next slide will show you just kind of a slightly new look to some of our settings forms. Um, not a lot has changed here. We've tried to organize the settings forms a little bit cleaner, make it a little bit easier to find what you're looking for. Uh, the, the big improvements here have been in kind of the infrastructural code that's powering these. Um, we were able to kind of modernize the whole platform a lot around this sort of stuff and set in place some uh, approaches that we're going to be taking going forward. Uh, and so now the settings form should be considerably more extensible or at least easier to extend and customize. Um, so if you do have developer assets at your disposal and you want to extend those settings, um, that should be pretty easy now. Uh, I, I say now, um, I should say this is, this is something that's going to be available in our next release, version 3.2. Um, so it's not out yet, but it's, it's coming down the pipeline. Um, and as always, we're working on improving kind of the accessibility um, of these forms as well, which is something we're, we're working on. Um, so the next slide will show you uh, probably the biggest change that's coming down, and this is also going to be arriving with 3.2. Um, you can go ahead and start the video anytime. Um, so this will just uh, this is some uh, this is introducing versioning to the system. So now, if you have kind of published an article or a book um, and you later want to make some changes, uh, now you can actually capture those changes in separate versions, and um, the front end will actually show you or allow readers to kind of see past versions and and actually um, get a sense of how that scholarly record has changed over time. Um, it also involves some major changes to the publishing workflow. So um, it could be a little bit of new learning that's going to be involved with your editors with 3.2. Um, but as part of this process, we're also really um, we're able to tackle some longstanding UX concerns um, that people have had uh, and finally get some of those things in place. So um, I'm excited about this move, even though it's going to cause a little bit of disruption for your editors. Um, this as well. Uh, 
originated all this work in some um, development from our German partners. Uh, so community involvement has, has been a big part of the work that we've done over the last year. Um, and uh, it, our, our developer team in the last year has, has really grown, um, particularly recently. Um, I don't think it was quite captured in the, um, the financial stats that, that Kevin showed earlier, but um, the team's definitely grown much more than any other time that I've, since I've been here in the last sort of four to five years. Uh, and that's, that's had a really big impact on our ability to pay down the technical debt that accrues in projects like ours uh, and help us, you know, spend some time to modernize the code base. And it's not glamorous work. There's nothing I can show you um, in a screenshot, but uh, this kind of work has a big impact on reducing the long-term maintenance costs and as well as development costs for the platform. Um, and in the process, we're also making a lot of improvements to how easy it is to kind of extend and customize the, the platform and how reliable it is when you do it. So, um, so that's been really exciting for me, at least over the last, um, last year to see those sorts of changes. So I'll hand it over to whoever's next. Thank you so much, Nate. That was amazing. Uh, great work on the docs. Let's echo that from um, Clinton. And great work to the theme team and to the developers. That was a, a great update. Thanks so much. Next up is James. James, can you take it away? Yep. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, <laughs> that's a hard show to follow. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> that all looks really amazing. And I am just all continuously amazed when I, when I see the stuff that Nate, uh, Nate uh, brings up. <clears throat> Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, XML uh, metrics and statistics. Um, most of you probably know me as the um, former publishing and services coordinator and the current uh, strategic projects and services um, dude. Um, so I'm, I'm just sort of, um, I've got uh, fingers in all sorts of different pies here. Um, but lately, outside of the publishing services stuff, I've been dealing a lot with metrics, reports, and XML publishing. So that's what I'm going to talk about today um, for five minutes or so. Um, and what I'm going to try and do is talk about mostly um, just focus on the things that we've been doing for the past year, uh, but I will talk about some of our upcoming plans and the current work that we're working on as well in all three of these areas. Um, so if we can just go to the next slide, we'll start with metrics. Um, so as Nate had uh, already mentioned, uh, we have a new uh, statistics visualization tool that is already available in OJS 312. Um, this was actually funded by uh, one of our clients uh, and, a, and a long time, uh, uh, well, long time for the past two years, um, development partner of ours, um, University of Minnesota Library Publishing Services. Um, so they requested um, some additional visualization tools for OJS uh, to be available. Um, so we worked through a specification with them um, and came up with uh, basically what you see here now, um, the ability to show um, the um, um, sort of the overall abstract views in a graphical format, um, and in, with an ability to filter by date, filter by journal section, and so on. Um, you can sort sort and search by author, by title, and by submission ID too. So you can get a lot of really interesting, uh, valuable information from the statistics framework that's already there within OJS. Um, again, that's already in OJS three one two. Um, and we are planning on uh, expanding upon this um, as we go forward as well. So offering, um, right now this is only available for editors, but we hope to have a, a, a similar view to this for authors for their own articles, for example, and also optionally a, a public view as well. Um, if we just go to the next slide. Um, we also worked on um, the internal um, reporting um, within OJS. So this isn't sort of metric statistics. These are the reporting tools. So this uh, comma separated value, value or the CSV tools that you use to extract information about your articles and about your reviews within OJS. Um, they've been in OJS since OJS 2, I think. Um, so, so they've been around for quite a while. Um, but in the, uh, I think it was the 2017 sprint in Montreal, um, it was sort of talked about um, um, expanding the, the amount of information that both of these, the article report and the review report had, uh, would, ha or would or should have within it. Um, so for example, the article report, making sure that it included all of the relevant dates um, for all of your articles in the, in, the, uh, in the system, from their initial submission to their editorial decision date, review dates, uh, the decisions themselves and the recommendations and so on. Um, so we worked on this specification with uh, Cielo uh, and with a few other partners as well. Um, and um, 
to finish the work uh, for OJS 3.1.2 as well. So you can see here what was in sort of the original OJS 2 slash 3 uh, compared to what's in OJS 3.1.2 now. Uh, that's just a sort of a sample um, chart there. Um, and if you just go to the next slide, um, you'll see the same thing, but for the review reports. So these are the reports that you can download that provides you with all the information that you need for um, um, all of the, the submission reviews in the system. So these now include the reviewer institution, along with obviously the reviewer name, um, their country, the reviewing interests, uh, their ORCID IDs if they're available, and all of the relevant dates uh, and the recommendations that uh, uh, sort of accord with that particular given review. Um, so again, all of this stuff is now available to you um, if you're using OJS 3.1.2. Um, if you just go to the next slide here. Um, this plugin, the most popular articles plugin, was also developed uh, in the past year, but I believe by uh, NTOC Nygaard, um, although he can, if he's on the, uh, the, the chat here, he can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, it will show in the sidebar the top X most popular articles that, uh, in a given month. So you can define how many, um, how many articles you want to demonstrate, or how many articles you want to show there. It shows the view count as well. So you can see for this particular journal, uh, Food and Nutrition Research, you have a list of the most read articles in that given month in the sidebar. Um, so that's available now in, uh, as of OJS 3.1. Um, and you can download it and install it straight from the plugin gallery, I believe. Um, next slide, please. We've also uh, worked with uh, an organization called Impact Story to develop um, a paper buzz altmetrics tool um, that overlays on cross-ref event data. Um, so this tool takes cross-ref event data. Um, cross-ref event data is just um, information about what happens to uh, an article and how it's referenced and how it's cited outside of your standard sort of journal citations or article citations out in the web. Um, and and cross-reference event data collects that information and provides it to um, any anyone who wants an open source, open data format. Um, Impact Story has created with uh, funding and support from us uh, a service called Paper Buzz that takes that raw data and converts it into something that's usable um, and available through their own public API. Um, so using uh, the just the recently launched Paper Buzz uh, uh, um, plugin you can now demonstrate um, for your articles, any tweets that have happened. Uh, I think soon to be Facebook lights. I'm not quite sure if that's there yet, but Juan can correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, Wikipedia, WordPress mentions, uh, any references in Hypothesis and more. Um, if we just go to the next slide here, we'll see, um, this is an article. Um, this is just a demonstration article that, I, that we put together just to sort of show the proof of concept. You see the article landing page there article by John Walensky, you might have heard of that guy. Um, and then just down below, you have a, just a, a, a visualization of the overall PDF views uh, and then the Twitter usage of that article, Wikipedia usage. Um, and just one more slide there, please. Oh, maybe that was it for that one. Um, sorry, if you can just go <laughs> back, more. I thought there was a second slide uh, showing the other stuff that kind of follows from there. But what you can see here is it just shows in a graphical format, um, say Twitter usage or Wikipedia usage or what have you here um, for that particular article. Um, any article that wants to use that has to have DOIs. Um, so you do have to use um, um, DOIs within your, within your uh, journal to, to get that data from cross event data. Um, okay, next slide please. Um, so this is something, uh, this is a, just a proof of concept. So the um, and apologies, uh, I guess right now to Nate for using this um, mock-up screenshot that he, <laughs> he provided me a while ago um, and uh, that I, I'm just using arbitrarily here. Um, but we are working again with the uh, University of Minnesota Library Publishing Services uh, to develop um, sort of an, another round of review and reporting, or sort of reporting tools. Uh, and this one in particular to provide folks with um, sort of a demonstration of editorial activity and uh, sort of just good, healthy editorial information about what's going on with your journal. Um, so to demonstrate in a visual way the number of submissions in a system, um, their accept and reject rate, where they are within the workflow. Uh, and then also to be able to provide you with the actual numbers. So you need to know, for example, the number of submissions received this year, the number accepted, the number declined, uh, and then, of course, the, the difference between the uh, desk reject and the uh, sort of post-review reject as well. 
Uh, we do want this information to be downloadable um, and also um, to have this information available in a monthly uh, informational email to the editors as well. Um, so this is in progress right now. I think uh, we're actually coming up uh, fairly close to being able to test this. Um, and we anticipate that it'll be available in OJS 3.2 or whichever the, the latest or the next stable release will be. Next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our XML publishing uh, work uh, lately. And a fair amount of this is happening under the auspices of the uh, Coalition Public Health Partnership we have with AUD and with a few others. Um, and what we're doing here, what we're attempting to do is to develop um, sort of a full XML publishing workflow where you have content come into OJS. Uh, if it's not XML already, uh, to, to have it converted into XML um, from Word or PDF. Um, to provide journals with the ability to edit that XML in a very intuitive way where you don't need to actually know the XML um, language uh, and you don't need to know XML typesetting. Uh, and then also to provide publishing straight from XML. So this is a sort of a, a post conversion step where the XML is then transformed into HTML, PDF, and EPUB. Um, so those are the three steps and I'll just talk about the first step in uh, conversion in the next slide here. So there are multiple tools available um, to folks who want to convert uh, Word or PDF documents to XML. Um, the ones that we're working with right now are Grobit, uh, which is a, a conversion utility that will take um, Word and uh, PDF and convert that eventually um, through, through some additional steps into JATS XML. Um, we're also working uh, with Heidelberg uh, and partnering with them a little bit on uh, the MeTypeset uh, tool set as well, which will do effectively the same thing. Uh, and then finally, we have a doc, docx to jats plugin that uh, our developer Vitaly has uh, developed as well, which is a, just a lightweight plugin that uh, you can install onto your server uh, that will take a, a Word file and convert that to jats XML. Um, these three conversion to utilities all work in different ways and they have different expectations. Um, so for example, the docx to jats will expect that you format your document in a relatively um, um, similar way every time according to sort of their best um, 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 requirements. So, so you, you have to use headers in a specific way and titles in a specific way and so on and so forth. Um, Grobit and me typeset are a little bit more flexible in that, um, but their accuracy and the conversion um, also varies. Um, so any of these tools will probably require some cleanup if you're using them. Um, right now, the only one that is available uh, immediately as of right now for use within OJS is the docx to JATS. Uh, the MeTypeset and the GrowVid tools are not available directly yet, but we're working on those. Uh, next slide, please. So once you have the XML file um, converted and uh, ready for some editing, um, there is already a, a new tool available called Texture. This is the Texture Editor. Um, you can see it in this, this screenshot the, on the right. Um, this is a, a, a utility. It's an open source application developed by the Substance Group um, um, in, in uh, sort of a consortium with PKP, RED, CLO, eLife, and at least one other organization that I'm forgetting right now. Um, but this allows you to open a JAX XML file in what we call a WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get kind of editor. Uh, and uh, clean up the file, upload images, um, update your metadata, um, update your references, do anything that you need to do within the XML file itself, but in an intuitive non-code kind of way. Um, so this is currently available for OJS. Um, we, it's, uh, I think it's been updated to the most recent version of Texture, um, but it's not supremely integrated in OJS just yet. You can use it. Um, you're able to edit a, a document within Texture, but it's sort of, um, the, the Texture editor pops outside of the, uh, the XML, or sorry, outside of OJS. So we are working on uh, just better integrating this in OJS itself um, over time. So keep, keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then finally, the next and last slide for me um, is just on the publishing end. Um, and this just to say, you know, there is the long standing lens reader, uh, which will take a JATS XML file uh, that you've uploaded as a galley and will render that in HTML. That's available now. Um, we are working on um, actually the, sorry, the uh, JATS parser, which is a, another uh, plugin by Vitaly is also available at this time. Um, and I believe that's available in the plugin gallery already. Um, that'll convert to HTML and also optionally to, to PDF. 
Um, and we are looking at other options to, um, to convert uh, content here over time as well. Um, and that's my presentation on those items. So I'll turn it back to Alan. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, James. That's fantastic. Uh, and you did follow Nate very well with statistics and conversion. So congratulations on that. Uh, please do, everyone, put their questions into the chat. We're going to get to that um, after a couple more updates. We are a little behind, so I'm hoping that we can move expeditiously. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael and Amanda to talk about publishing services. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We sure can. Thanks so much. Great. Uh, my name is Amanda Stevens, and I'm the Services and Support Coordinator for PKP. So I coordinate support for publishing services and uh, the other aspects of support for the organization. Um, and so today I'm going to give a brief update on publishing services activities in the last fiscal year. Um, so we uh, publish, publishing services is a branch of PKP that provides an important source of revenue for the organization and provides PKP software hosting, technical support, custom development, and consulting services to users who don't have the technical ex expertise or infrastructure to do these things themselves. So it allows more publishers to use our software. And as Alan said in the introduction, it also generates about 50% of PKP's annual operating budget. Um, so typically, uh, the growth that we see over each year is about 60 new journals um, being added. Uh, but this last year, we actually saw an increase of 81 new journals. Um, that brings our total hosted journals to 411 and our total clients to 270 at the end of the fiscal year. Um, so we're really proud of that growth. And um, it's partly due to an increase in our staff resources over the last two years and streamlining and formalizing our workflows um, because this has allowed us to provide better service and be more responsive to existing clients and to new clients who are interested in our services. Um, so some of the notable new clients and journals that we've um, started working with in the last year are Agger University, uh, IEE, Oceanic Engineering Society, Duke University Libraries at the University of Minnesota, uh, Ball State University, Boston College, Iowa State University Library, and Indiana State University. So a lot of those are sort of bigger institutions that we host multiple journals for. Um, and in the annual report, um, a couple of those uh, clients are highlighted and you can get some more details about what we did with them or for them. Um, so with um, some of one of the highlights in terms of streamlining our workflows is that um, we used to use three separate systems for keeping track of all of our client information, managing our accounting and finances, um, and managing all of our client support. But in the last year, we adopted a new uh, customer relationship management tool called Excello that allowed us to consolidate all of those systems into one Place. So now we just have to go to one, go, just have to go to Excello and we can see all of the information about our clients, what kind of work we've, we are doing for them, what we have done for them, um, all of our communication and all of our billing. So that's really made our jobs a lot more efficient and has freed up time to do other things, including just formalizing a lot of our policies and procedures, um, which makes it a lot easier for onboarding new staff as well. Uh, we have hired two new staff members on the publishing services team in the last year, Jonas Rayoni and Jason Nugent, um, who are both uh, amazing systems people. Um, and coming up in this coming year, we hope to um, grow our team a little bit more as we continue to also grow the number of clients and journals that we're servicing. Um, and we've already actually hired two new part-time people that just started recently that we're happy to have on board. Um, and we're going to focus our efforts on getting more multi-journal institutions um, as our clients. And we've developed a new institutional hosting plan to um, make it easier for those organizations to join us. Uh, and then also just continue to sort of um, formalize uh, and document some of our policies and procedures and um, improve our information management and knowledge management. Um, so Michael Felsack is going to continue with the publishing services update and talk more about the system side of things. Hey everyone, 
I um, hope you can hear me a-okay. Um, Alan, can you just please confirm, just so I'm not uh, talking to myself here? We can hear you. Sounds great. Perfect. Okay, yeah. So I just want to say um, a few words about uh, some of the nuts and bolts uh, of our infrastructure, um, both for hosting as well as just the, uh, the wider PKP server infrastructure. Uh, we've had quite a busy year with, uh, with a server migration where... Uh, moving away from the SFU library servers, which have been a good home to us for uh, over a decade now and, uh, and, and, and really represent where hosting uh, for PKP journals uh, began. But uh, we've been slowly um, um, outgrowing um, our capacity there. And, uh, and in parallel, we, we've also uh, been running a, uh, a uh, on commercial uh, hosting um, services, and we've been moving away from the SFU library servers, which are now getting a little bit older, both in terms of hardware and software, and uh, and moving um, our hosted clients to our commercial uh, hosted infrastructure with uh, with Gossamer Threads in Vancouver, uh, who have been um, long term. Uh, partners with us and uh, and have uh, continued to provide um, great service and support uh, to our team and so um, so this entails uh, moving hosted journals over um, and 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 it also uh, signals for us a move towards a single hosting environment um, standardized server setups um, more flexible software upgrades and, uh, and simplified system workflows. Um, all of this comes by way of just not needing to manage two server environments uh, that are configured in somewhat different ways and have separate workflows and, uh, and, uh, and slightly different software installed there. So this should um, help us uh, to continue to provide uh, uh, good service to our uh, hosted journals and will hopefully result in some ongoing efficiencies um, since there's only going to be uh, a need to maintain a single environment there. Um, along with uh, that migration, we've all also been undertaking some hardware upgrades. We've been um, moving some of our servers from uh, mechanical hard drives to the faster solid state drives. Uh, this uh, will mean faster load times for hosted journals, but it's also going to be a reduction in downtime uh, um, for journals during uh, upgrades, as well as just less time for our system staff uh, as they um, uh, 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 troubleshoot uh, tickets. And, and at times, you know, need to move a significant amount of data from server to server. Uh, so hopefully that will continue to uh, speed things up there. Um, on the software side, we've been gradually rolling out uh, PHP 7 support across all of our servers. Uh, we now have dual support for PHP 5 and PHP 7. Um, we still do have some older OJS 2 uh, hosted journals uh, who have not made the move to OJS 3. So we continue to uh, support them uh, via PHP 5. And uh, all new OJS3 releases, uh, as many of you know, do require PHP 7. So we're going to be running the, uh, the latest there to, uh, to support those installs. Um, we've also been expanding uh, the amount of automation um, uh, in our work processes. Um, we're, we continue to develop new command line tools uh, to improve our management of our OJS installs. Um, this past year, we did add a, a new tool for uh, generating uh, server installation reports, um, as well as managing server-wide and install specific config settings from the command line. And, uh, and we continue to um, work on those um, as the need arises and as, uh, as requirements uh, come in from, uh, from hosted journals and, uh, and we identify uh, ways to um, reduce the amount of repetitive work on our end and uh, and see what and where we can uh, automate. Um, wrapping up and, uh, and looking ahead, um, we're going to, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to continue uh, to improve our install management uh, tools 
Uh, we're hoping to further automate our upgrade workflows, and this is an ongoing work in progress. And uh, we're also looking to expand our tool sets for uh, uh, supporting large back issue imports. Uh, we do continue to see uh, requests for importing um, uh, back issue collections uh, f uh, from hosted uh, journals. And, uh, and likewise for, for managing day-to-day -day, um, things like uh, spam user accounts and, uh, and helping editors clean those out out of their hosted journals. Um, so uh, that work is, is always ongoing uh, for us and, uh, and we'll continue to, uh, to chip away at those. So uh, in the service of, uh, of time, I'm gonna uh, stop there and, uh, and hand it over uh, back to Alan. Great, thanks Amanda and Michael, that's fantastic. I'm looking forward to working with you on transitioning some journals in the future too. John, it, we're up next with you and we're, we cut into our Q&A time quite a bit, so I hope that's okay. If you, again, that's if you do have questions, please do pop them into the chat and we'll get to them. Uh, but with that, I'll uh, turn it over to John for okay. research and next steps. Uh, actually, uh, Juan, Pablo Alpern, and myself, both responsible for the research side of things, will be speaking very briefly. Watch how briefly I can do this. Um, <clears throat> beginning Thank with um, our advocacy role, uh, I'm going to actually highlight that. Um, we've had some success this year as advocates of open access through this subscribe to open model that Kevin referred to earlier. Um, and we actually have publishers uh, undertaking this. Annual Reviews um, and Berghahn Books are both in 2020 going to approach their libraries that typically subscribe with them. And their renewal is going to be at a similar rate, a little bit less for annual reviews, in fact. Um, and the result will be the journals will be published open access. This is a sustainable model, a revenue neutral model for the publishers and a cost neutral model for the libraries. It is a, a, a simpler change, we believe. No APCs, no embargoes, no um, read and publish kinds of, of new price structures. Uh, and we're very excited. So the proof will come out over the fall when we see how many libraries renew on a subscribe to open basis and how many new libraries actually get involved. So the advocacy role grows out of research we've been doing on cooperative forms of publishing, um, but it's been an exciting ride and it's just unfolding now. Juan, I turn it over to you. Thanks, John. I'll try to be just as, uh, as brief, but I do want to talk a little bit about a few different projects that were um, uh, that I've been sort of heading up and the work that I've been doing with the Scholarly Communications Lab, uh, which is sort of my the, the research group that I lead, co-lead with uh, Stephanie Houston at the University of Ottawa, where we're doing research on all kinds of things related to scholarly communications. Probably the most pertinent one uh, that I think James alluded to earlier uh, was around um, trying to work on being able to collect metrics for Facebook. So we continue to be doing work on different things related to alt metrics or social media metrics. And one of those things has been exploring really the most appropriate ways of collecting and gathering data from the messiness of social media, including Facebook through measures that, and trying to capture and identify to what extent are uh, organizations like altmetric.com really missing a lot of the engagement that's happening on that platform. So we've done a couple of publications related uh, to that, one that we were just finishing up today, and the idea is to take those results and then use them to build into uh, a, a tool to collect Facebook metrics for uh, OJS journals that have uh, DOIs and be able to push that onto Crossref event data and to paper buzz and so on. The other two uh, things that I wanted to touch upon briefly, one is a project that has been getting quite a little bit of attention that again is, goes more towards the advocacy side, which is exploring um, different, uh, an element of the, uh, that's preventing the adoption of open access and that is exploring different issues to do with incentives. So we have a project that has been looking at the review tenure and promotion guidelines and the ways that they capture uh, and incentivize or in some cases disincentivize the, uh, the uh, sort of community engagement, publicness and open access in general. Uh, just wanna highlight one key finding from that is that we looked at hundreds of review tenure and promotion documents from over from 129 different universities in the US and Canada. Uh, and only 5% of the institutions mentioned open access in those documents. And in actually most of those cases, they did so uh, in reference to predatory open access journals or in ways that were not quite encouraging of open access. So, so that's a project that's um, 
it continues to be underway. We survey faculty, so it's a multi-year project funded by the Open Society Foundations. And then the last thing that I want to highlight is part of the work that we're doing that's spinning off from the work that we did on metrics uh, is that the lab is sort of moving into uh, looking at uh, the uh, how research is mentioned in the news and trying to look at sort of science communication and from the science communication angle and trying to really understand uh, seeing how what the public uptake is of scholarly research uh, and looking at the relationship to open access, of course, but also just generally to see the way that research is framed by the news, what research gets covered, and we've done several uh, sort of publications on work related to that, one on looking at cancer news research, and we just uh, submitting one very recently published preprint just yesterday on looking at opioid research and what gets mentioned uh, in the popular news press, and so that's an area where I think we'll continue to be doing more work going forward. And then very last thing to say, not uh, research related, but I just want to say that we've received a lot of, um, we've, uh, last year, just in October, at the lab, we launched a visiting scholars program, uh, and that which was very successful. We received about 70 applications for people wanting to do short research stays. We were only able to bring five people. Um, so I'll just invite everyone to go to the Skullcom lab website, and you can look at the profiles of the visiting scholars that have come. Mm -hmm. And now, for the most part, except for one, have, uh, have, um, have left the lab. And I'll leave it there for now. And there's lots of other research that we've got ongoing and coming, but that will be for next year's AGM. Perfect. Thanks, John and Juan. Uh, Kevin, I'm sorry I had one job and I've lost 11 minutes for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Huh? <laughs> okay. So with that, I think we are at the Q&A and lots of stuff have come into the chat. Do you want to take it over and uh, see if we can get some of these questions answered? Yeah, I think some of them have been... Uh... Getting answered, answered on the way. Yep. Answered on the way. Uh, let's take a look. There is a question there about paper buzz um, and working with Crossref DOI information or data, data site uh, DOI, DOI information as well. Either James or Juan want to respond to that one? I asked this one on Twitter recently to the really paper buzz is pulling anything that's in Crossref event data. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Crossref event data is also bringing in uh, data site DOIs. And so the, um, so data site it is both Crossref and uh, data site DOIs that are um, that, that where the metrics are being captured and anything that's coming through uh, from Crossref will make it into paper buzz, which is what the OJS journals can pull. Yeah, and I can actually, Juan, I think I can confirm that from um, a Q&A we had about that with uh, Crossref in attendance at um, Library Publishing Forum. They, they confirmed that as well. Great. And I see Ramon had a question on about the server side and about how system requirements are improved to make sure an OJS installation is correct. I'm not sure if that's something that we can answer in this short space of time. Is anyone here want to Take a crack at that. Um, I mean, I can, I can take a quick crack at it, um, and unless Michael has uh, some thoughts here. But I mean, basically, I, th I think if I'm reading that question right, and Ramon, correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, like, like what we're trying to do basically is just standardize our environment um, to make sure that we have everything we need to run OJS and its affiliated components correctly. Um, this is a bit more complicated for us because we run things from Git and GitHub. So we need, for example, Node and Git, obviously, and a recent version of Git um, and Composer and a whole bunch of other things that you don't necessarily need if you're running, um, say, from a, like a, a downloaded OJS package from the website. Um, so our use case is a little bit unique um, in that we need some other tools like that. Um, and uh, Israel and Michael, who are on the on the um, call here, maybe Jason as well, can mention like some of the other, you know, just general bits and pieces. But even like down to like, Let's Encrypt for SSL, you know, all that stuff. We just try and have a very standard, easy to manage, uh, easy to deploy environment. Great, thanks, guys. Um, there were a couple of questions about um, reports. Um, Ramon had a question on stats and reports. Will they generate HTML tables um, or still output CSV files? And then uh, Lisa also had a question about reports. Can you do an analysis on the manuscript management process, average length of time for reviews, average length of time a given reviewer took? Um, mm -hmm. so, so you want to jump in on those? Yeah, um, I, can, I can talk about that really briefly too. So um, the reports, uh, if memory serves, they'll be downloadable in CSV. 
um, these are the new visualizations, like the editorial history, or the, sorry, the editorial um, reports. So like um, where things are in the workflow and things like that. Um, so it will be an HTML table that you'll be able to look at, but also you, you should have a download option so that you can download a CSV file with that information as well. Um, and sorry, what was the other the question from Lisa? Oh, can you do any analysis <clears throat> on right. the management process? Yeah, so you would be able to do that through the CSV report itself. So downloading the CSV re report will give you the uh, numbers you can then use to sort of do different analysis as, as you need to. Um, over time, if there's like a, you know, standard requests for certain types of numbers that would be helpful to have there by default, we can, we can obviously work that in. Um, but, but at least initially, it'll be a fairly um, straightforward report without a whole lot of um, sort of calculated numbers there. Cool, thank you. And any other questions that people have, if you want to drop them in there. There's a question here about um, openjournalsystems.com. I think we, we'll leave that aside. Um, this isn't a, a good venue to have that discussion. <laughs> Ask other questions people might have. Feel free to type them in there. Um, just one quick aside. I am seeing a fair bit of interest in sort of maybe the opportunity for a, a, some sort of systems workshop, <laughs> which is not something I thought about <laughs> coming into this AGM. Um, but just as an aside, um, if, if anybody has like Clinton, Mark, Bria, Ramon, anybody who wants to talk a little bit more about systems deployment stuff, um, maybe uh, shoot me an email um, and we can start to arrange something for that. Uh, with the caveat that I'm still on vacation for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Good caveat. And there's a question here from uh, Texas Digital Library about the PKP Preservation Network plugin and that's it's functioning. Uh, so we want to jump on that one. Uh, Kevin, I'm here. This is Mark. Oh, hey, Mark. Thanks. Um, can I clarify that question? Um, uh, when you say functioning again, do you mean uh, the uh, three, uh, the version for uh, OJS 3, 3X, or is there something about the version for 2X that wasn't functioning for you? Maybe while the, they get a chance to type in the reply, Mark, can you just give us sort of an update on 3? Okay. So um, the, the uh, team within PKP that is working on this uh, just met last week, uh, this week in fact, and we are now uh, planning to start testing with self-nominated uh, journals uh, in the middle of August. So if you are interested in helping us test the first uh, release of this plugin to the public, um, I'd be happy to um, paste the URL into the forum post, a forum thread that uh, uh, where we ask people to, to nominate themselves to test. And at that time, in the middle of August, we will contact you with uh, testing instructions. Um, so we hope to have this rolled out uh, uh, very soon after that, as long as testing goes well, and we're, uh, we are uh, predicting it will go well. Um, yeah. So that's 3.0, uh, 3.x. And um, I think, Clinton, was it you that asked for both? Yes. Yeah, okay. it was Clinton. Um, so the, I think you're referring to uh, an outage that, ex that happened here at Simon Fraser University where, uh, yeah, right, where we, uh, the, the staging server that the PKP PN plugin installed in each uh, journal communicates with this server and it, that initiates the, the, the process by which our, uh, issues are harvested. Um, that server was down for an extended number of days, six, five or six days and it is now up and operational. So it's, uh, as far as we know, things are back to nominal levels. And if that is not the case for your journal, please report it to the forum or through other channels you might think are effective. But uh, that server is back up now. Great, thanks, Mark. There's a question up above from Joe about um, any future- <laughs> Any, sorry, any future plans for OCS? Um, as many of you know, it's sort of been set aside so that we've been able to focus on 
all of the work that you saw reported out on today for for OJS and you know the uh, the related services around XML and Paper Buzz and other things. So it was a it was a hard decision, but we had to prioritize our development effort. And OCS has been sort of set aside until we could return to it, and that's still the the case for it. Um, the amount of work that we're being able to get done and the advances we're being able to make on OJS really have been the priority, and that's where our funding priority have been uh, established too. So at this time, OCS continues to uh, to sit as is, um, but we'll uh, provide updates as we see a way to to make some progress there, or at least give some updates. Other questions? Got like a minute left, 30 seconds. Slide one in. Or Alan, maybe I'll turn it over to you for closing, seeing that we're getting close to that time. We could do that. I could ask about uh, Coalition Publica if you'd like as well, but we probably are close enough. Just to say Coalition Publica, as uh, I mentioned it sort of at the beginning, um, the, the project that we're working with, um, with ARD at the University of Montreal, um, where we're combining our OJS with their um, national aggregation platform to be able to form a, a national infrastructure for scholarly publishing in Canada. I'm also working closely with CRKN, the consortium of uh, research libraries across the country to be able to support journals um, that are open access or journals that are making the transition to open access. So it's a, a really exciting project that we're um, just really uh, making some great progress on and we'll uh, continue to provide updates on our blog um, through that. I also want to make sure that I take a second to plug the PKP conference in Barcelona mm -hmm. that's happening in November. If that uh, isn't on your radar, please put it there and we would hope to see you there. We're going to have a couple of days of sprinting. We're going to have a day full of workshops and then we're going to have two days of uh, invited speakers and uh, speakers who've been making submissions that all look fantastic. So we do hope that you can all make it to Barcelona in November. And Alan, back to you. Great, thanks for putting that in. Um, I hope we do see people in Barcelona. Uh, I think we had 100 people um, in this AGM uh, this time. So I, that's a, a new record, I think, for us. Uh, so that's fantastic. It's great to see that level of engagement from people. Uh, and I guess I would like to thank everyone for their uh, support and uh, uh, interest in PKP and for their participation and attendance today. Thank you very, very much. And with that, I think we can close the AGM.